So I had to solve a problem on my instrument because I was practicing it a lot. I listened to other players and I had the same problems with the other players. So I thought, yeah, I have to change something. There has to be something wrong in my instrument. And then it started. Hello, and welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute-related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 42, a discussion with Hans Kautz, the inventor of Le Freak. Before getting into today's episode, founded in Boston, Massachusetts in 1888, the William S. Haynes Company creates bespoke professional concert flutes and head joints for flutists around the world. These sought-after instruments are prized for the rich and colorful timbre that only a Haynes instrument can offer. The master flute makers at the William S. Haynes Company are constantly listening to the current needs of flutists so they can craft an instrument that meets today's requirements. Their dedication to the Boston tradition of flute making and meeting the demands of a modern flutist is carried through every instrument which bears the Haynes monogram. Follow them at Haynes Flutes on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hello, Hans. Hi, Heidi. Hi, how are you today? I'm fine, and you? What time is it with you? It is noon. It's noon, yeah. Here we are just in the evening, so... You're in Amsterdam, correct? I'm close to Amsterdam. Yeah. It's about 40 minutes by car, so it's not too far. I've heard it's a beautiful city. I am so jealous. Yeah, Amsterdam is really, really beautiful. Yeah. A lot of waters and you can just go with boats through the old buildings. It's really, really amazing. So if you go to Amsterdam, do that kind of things. Uh. Not what all the others come for. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) I just finished um, Hans Brinker. Okay. Yeah. So Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were talking about the waterways and the windmills. Yeah, and it's, it's, yeah they are amazing. Yeah. Oh, cool. It, 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 yeah. So I want to dive in and get to know who you are as a person. Could you give us your background, please? Yes, I can. My background, if I just start as a kid, I started with a, a piccolo as a small kid. I heard this beautiful a recording of James Galway, of course, and I knew, of course, that I wanted to be a flute player. Mm. So, and my parents liked it, and they were very enthusiastic till the moment that I said I want to be a professional player. And then it turned a little different because they were a little afraid that you couldn't make any money with music. Mm. Um, I started also saxophone, so I played two instruments, and then... Yeah, I was listening to my parents a little bit like, yeah, you have to choose something that you can make a living with. So Mm. I studied electronics, a physical study, but my music was still, yeah, not away, not for a minute. So I even, it even got worse. So I studied a lot flute and a lot saxophone. And after my electronics or during my electronics study, I did an audition for a conservatory and But the only thing I had a problem because I also started saxophone, I couldn't choose. Mm -hmm. So then I tried to do audition for both instruments and I thought they will choose for me and then it's okay. Then I I don't have to choose for myself. There you go. Uh, But they accepted me both. So I could, yeah, couldn't choose again. And then I tried both instruments. I did two, two instruments at the conservatory, classical flute and classical saxophone. And yeah, I finished up being a professional musician Mm -hmm. for both instruments. So that was a little bit in a rush who I am. I was always interested in techniques, but yeah, my heart was in the the music. So that's why I became a musician. Wow, what a great history. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and I'm thankful that I did the electronics because that made me capable of producing the... Sound rates, Le Freak. So, yeah. So, when you say electronics, are you referring to like physics or engineering? Engineering. I had my own studio with audio equipment also, but I quit that stuff. Okay. Because I, I was just too busy. But yeah, electronics, so like amplifiers and all those stuff. Oh, nice. So, 
Yeah. Very cool. So yeah, I'm sure the history or your background in education in engineering and sound engineering, it sounds like, really definitely helped with uh, transitioning to producing and having the idea of La Freak. Yeah, absolutely. That uh, I was always already a teacher that was was always looking for explanations to, to my students, just to explain really what happens in yeah, a physical way. Because if you have a teacher and just tells you, you have to do it different or play a little bit more like this, then yeah, what do you mean? Mm. And I always was yeah trying to explain it a little bit more yeah, in a physical way that I really understood what, what I did. And then at the moment I had this problem that I had to play a piece and then I could teach myself and I could find out what was the problem. Mm. And that's the, yeah, then it happened. Wow. So you were looking for the why. I mean, you were trying to answer yeah. why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had to play a crazy piece or a, not crazy. I, I love the piece for alto sax and mallets, so all tuned percussion. And I couldn't be happy with tuning of the high notes, the altissimo. And so that became my problem. I promised to play the piece and I couldn't be satisfied with uh, the piece. And so I had to solve a problem on my instrument because I was practicing it a lot. I listened to other players and I had the same problems with the other players. So I thought, yeah, I have to change something. There has to be something wrong in my instrument. And then it started. Wow. So I read online that you started the company in 2008. Is that correct? In 2008, I didn't start the company. Okay. In 2008, I had to play that, that piece. And then uh -huh. I found out the first yeah, sound bridge. So that was the first prototype. And then it took me about four years to make a, a real product of the, the prototype. Because first of all, I was just thinking... I can order this thing online because I came up with the problem and the answer, but I thought, yeah, why didn't someone else already make this huh. and that I can just order it and be happy. <laughs> and I couldn't, yeah. it was not there. Yeah. So, and then I started looking for a patent. So I patented the product and then it had to be a product for more wind instruments because I just, I designed it for saxophone. Mm. And then I thought, yeah, maybe with the flute, I had a, a wooden flute with cork in, and the cork was what, tr what triggered me in the first uh, moment. So I tried the flute with the bypass, with the sound bridge, and I was really shocked that it was this difference. And I, I thought, yeah, why not also my silver flute? Mm. And then I was a little bit surprised because I thought that silver in silver, so must be good mm. but it still is the same problem and now i know exactly why but then i was close to knowing why it happened but yeah i did a lot of research and in those four years it became really a product and a more universal shape so that i can use it for all the wind instruments so it's not only for flute it's for saxophone, it's for trumpet, it's, you can use it on all the wind instruments as long as it's more than one part. Uh -huh. So the only thing I can't put it on is a didgeridoo. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. one piece. <laughs> it's one piece. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. So about four years, you're saying, from the idea, the conception of it to production, it was a timeline of about four years total? Yes, yeah. Wow. About four years, yes. Very cool. So throughout those four years, what obstacles came along the way and how did you overcome them? Oh, yeah. If you have a good idea and you start a company, <laughs> there are always people that like to jump in. Oh, I see. And I had one of that kind of people that they were in and then stopped and said, okay, you can buy me out. Mm -hmm. So... We had that problem Wow! and that problem solved itself because I don't want to complain. So <laughs> I, that was okay. And then I had a really problem to find materials. So the problem of making the product was not too difficult at the end because I found a producer that could 
make all kinds of things from metal. So I just told him what I wanted. I made my own prototypes and then we put it in a 3D image and we made a tool to make the shape of the 3D, so the shape of the Le Freaks. Mm. So that was all under control. But the most difficult part actually was making it on the instrument, putting it on. Oh. And I already knew the way that we use now. I wanted to make such a thing, but the really difficult thing was find the right elastic band and find something like this ball that we have on, on the elastic band. That was really tricky to get it on. Oh. It was a, a really hard time. So the first years we had to sell it with just a silicone band. Okay. And But silicone is not the best product to use because it's a very dampening product. So a dampening material on something that you want to take away the dampening, that's not... That's not solving the problem. <laughs> no. So that, that was the only solution at that moment. And it worked pretty okay because a lot of very good flute players used it from the beginning. And like Emily Bynen from the Concertgebouw Orchestra in Amsterdam, mm. she is one of my first... Yeah, really amazing players on the flute that yeah tried it and never took it off anymore. So and she used in the beginning also the silicone bands because we didn't have anything else. And then at a certain moment with a lot of experimenting and then we had finally we could make this ball and yeah glue the elastic in with the right glue. So all the stuff to to get it yeah it was really difficult. Wow. So it was the materials. And like you said, you started off with one material, found out it didn't have the results that you wanted, but you had to experiment. And I love that word. You always had to probably dive in and say, okay, this doesn't work. What else can, you know, what else in my wheelhouse could I use to get the results that I want? Yes, of course. Yeah. And then that's only just the way to attach it on the instrument. And then we had also the it's not a problem, but the first one that we made was just a copper one. And then we started with sterling silver. And yeah, then we wanted to go further because, yeah, if you want to make it for a flute, uh, yeah, sterling silver is the, the lowest material you can actually use because a little bit of good flute is already sterling silver. So you have a lot of different materials that you use for Le Freak. Rose gold, gold, silver. Yes. And just with, like with any instrument, you're going to get a different timbre. Yeah, and it's just a physical thing. Because if you look at silver, silver has a certain speed of transmitting a sound. Okay. And then you go to the next silver part or to maybe to gold. or So if you want to make a jump to an, a different material, you already can use a different Le Freak. But the base material, normally we say use the same material as your instrument mm -hmm. or a higher quality. And then for flute, it's normally we start with, with a solid sterling silver uh, Le Freak, and then you can say, okay, maybe I want a gold plating. Mm -hmm. And then we have a rose gold plating that opens up the sound a little bit. And we have a yellow gold plating, 24 karat, and that makes the sound a little darker. Mm -hmm. But if you have a riser, for instance, of 14K gold, 14 karat rose gold, then almost 99% of the occasions, the rose gold plate at Le Freak or the rose gold is the better option because oh. you start at the very beginning of your instrument with a certain sound of the rose gold. Then the match normally is also the rose gold plating or the rose gold. Okay. It's really... Okay. And in the beginning of the instrument, there something happens. And then, yeah, the match normally is also if you use the same material in the Le Freak again. Oh, wow. I didn't even think of it like that, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's like if we make a small jump to the saxophone players, if they have a ligature of a yellow gold plating, the rose gold plating is not working too well. Then you need the yellow. Huh. Because it's really the sound of the very beginning of, of a lip plate of, or a riser makes such a huge impact on the instrument in the sound that if you use the same material for the bridge, mm. then it, it just works 
it's the better choice. Huh. Very cool. Well, I don't know if you received this feedback from other flutists, but when I use Le Freak, I feel more connected to my instrument. Yeah, I hear that a lot. Okay. I think I have the same experience myself. Oh, with, yeah, when you play saxophone and flute. Yeah, it, it's just for me. It, normally, if I played and I meant a certain sound in my head, my instrument yeah, seems to change it a little bit. Hmm. But with my Le Freak song now, I just get the sound that I really mean to play. That's for me the more connected feeling, I think. Okay. Do you hear the same results from bassoonists and trumpeters and the brass guys? Yes. Yeah. And people ask me all the time, what instrument does it make the biggest difference? I don't know. It, for me, it's all the same. Okay. It's all the same principle and it's all the same yeah, the only thing is if you have a bassoon, you have a lot of more problems on the instrument than on the flute. Right. But it's just two really connections. And one what, that you can solve a little bit as a feedback from the, the crown part. I see. So, and for bassoons, yeah, there's a lot going on in that instrument. Yeah. So how did you come up with the name Le Freak? It's, uh, the first one that I made was a little different. And it was only based on, yeah, attaching it on the saxophone. Mm. And the saxophone is a, a Belgium guy who lived in Paris. And in Paris, he designed the saxophone. So it was a French-speaking guy. And I thought, yeah, what do I do? I just pass the frequencies from one to the other part. So I make a bypass so that I can yeah, transport the frequencies from the mouthpiece to the second part of my instrument and oh. make it easier to play. So it's the frequence that I give on. So oh. that was the first thing that I thought about Le Frec. I, I needed something that didn't exist yet, that if you want to make a product, you have to think about the name that you can Google it. And that is not that you are number 460 in the first year, because there are a lot of other people using the same name. So you cannot do that. So it has to be a, a little bit unique name. And what I do is just passing on frequencies from one to the other part. And that's that's the only thing. Yeah. So that's why I came up with, uh, in the first time, it was Le Frec, and it ended at the Q. Hmm. But because I made it more universal, that I can use it for all the wind instruments, we needed to change the patent and yeah, to, to make it a real different pattern. So we decided to change the name a little bit. And then we made it together, Le Freak. And it's just frequencies that we pass on. And I think Le Freak sounds nicer than Le Freak. <laughs> so I think so too. But it's neat to see that evolution. And that's really neat how you attributed it to the saxophone inventor, him living in Paris. Yeah, yeah. It, it, he made such a beautiful instrument. So I thought, yeah, a little bit connected to that of sax. It's a yeah. good thing, I think. Yeah, that's beautiful. Very cool. I really like the title Soundbridge also that goes with Le Freak because yeah. it explains what it does. It's literally bridging the yeah. sound. Yeah, it, that's why I thought I can order it on the internet because it's too simple. Yeah. In a lot of other, like in the wind instruments, in the music, it's not never anyone thought about that. If you make two parts together, you create a resistance. Mm. And some people thought about it, but the resistance is not only slowing down your tone, but the resistance is frequency dependent. And that's the, the worst of the resistance. So the lower frequencies go faster than the higher frequencies at the connection. And like in the light industry or in the electronics, and I think your husband will say, oh, yeah, an impedance, a frequency dependent resistance, that's what it is. Mm. And it's just in the wind instruments the same. And I just offer the tone, yeah, a bypass, just go without the frequency dependence resistance to the next part. And then you solve a lot of tuning problems in overtones and you get away with a lot of reflections normally. At the end of the head joint, your tone is bouncing back. Mm. And that's negative part if you play your tone on, 
because it's always a negative thing, the tone that turns back. You don't want it. So now it goes to the second part. And then you don't have this small negative part of your feedback. So that's really what it does. And yeah, it's just a sound bridge. It's not more. Yeah, keeping it simple and it does what it says it's going to do. Yeah. So even before I called you for our talk today, my husband and I were discussing Le Freak and he was thinking in his audio engineer mind, like you just mentioned, and he said, I bet a player would want to experiment with this sound bridge, especially in the setting of a recording studio, to maybe pick up different um, harmonics. Since the microphones, because he said, you know, like what we do as an art for audio engineering, different microphones give different results. And of course, Mm -hmm. the higher you go up, you know, it'll pick up certain sounds of the instrument. You know, a higher microphone will do that for you rather than a low costing microphone. And so he was kind of curious just to kind of get a little freak in front of a microphone and just see if the different harmonics will show up on his screen or if you will um, hear it. He will. If you use a solid silver or a gold plated or a brass or a gold, you will see a lot of difference in in the whole structure of the tone. Uh And you will really see the difference. What for audio engineers is is really a cool thing is that the instrument starts to be a surround sound instrument. So you don't have the the really hot spot on the instrument anymore because it's more projective in the whole room. So it's easier to catch the whole sound of the instrument. And even if you move a little bit as a player, you don't have the problem anymore. So I think for him, if wind players play with the freak, it's pretty yeah nice. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So what resources did you use throughout your journey? Were there any books or websites or people that you picked their brains? The reason I ask is for any new inventor out there who has this great idea but doesn't know how to get started. Mm-hmm. I didn't use any books to, to invent it, if you mean that. Or do you mean in, in making the company? Um, either one. Either um, any on. resources for the actual production or the company. Yeah, for the production, it's all my, yeah, my mind is never quiet. It's always working. I always think if I see something, uh, how does it work and how can I change it? There's some some crazy thing in my mind. I always try to find solutions and that's why I made it up. Like, yeah, I just figured out all the things. And if I go back to the first time that I needed it, I had to play this really crazy altissimo. And if all the overtones slow down more than the fundamental, now I know why they were too sharp. Because if a tone is traveling and it slows down, it becomes a shorter wavelength. And shorter wavelengths are sharper tones, are higher frequencies. So that's why all these overtones were so sharp that it was impossible to play it in tune. And I tried all kinds of new fingerings. And I, yeah, I just thought in the natural scale of harmonics, it has to be in tune with this fingering, but it didn't. It was also too sharp. And then I blamed my saxophone. (laughs) And then I was looking like, okay, I just look at it as an energy. Just the energy is my tone. My tone is a fundamental and my overtones and they start to travel. And the fastest way to travel is not what all instrument makers focus on is the air. No, it's not the air. The air is 10 times slower, at least, than through the instrument, through the material. So the influence of the material was always a little bit like, yeah, people couldn't really tell if it really was a big difference if you build it, make an instrument with a different material. And I was like, no way, this is the most important thing because that's the most of the energy will travel in the material because it's the easiest path it's the fastest way and that's what triggered me looking at my instrument like okay it it travels through the mouthpiece it's a hard material so it's fast and then i saw my mouthpiece is connected through cork and i was like whoa okay cork that's the the slowest material on earth almost 
Yeah. And then it can go on fast again. So I was like, okay, this must be a huge problem. Wow. And then I just made a bypass. And that started to yeah, let me think more about all the physical things because I tried it and I called a friend of mine. He's, I'm a saxophone player and a flute player, but he is only flute player. So I thought I need ears that listen to what I do without accepting like the problems of the saxophone. So I played two times the same piece for him and I said, okay, can you tell me what you hear? And he really kind of freaked out when I did because I said, he said, what do you do? It's it's crazy. It's so such a difference. It's so in tune. And I said, okay, yeah, I was wondering why, but this is the problem of my instrument. Then I showed him and that was the really start of the product. Wow. Just thinking about all those things. The takeaway that I'm getting from this is kind of connecting it with another interview I did with another flute inventor. His name is Ho Fan Lee, and he created his thumb port. And I'm hearing, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm hearing similarities between his answer and yours. And it boils down to there was a problem. I noticed yep. the problem and I wanted to find a solution. So I experimented and here's my product. And it's just really neat to see that same theme. Yeah. 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 But for me, I had a problem and I, yeah, I just wondered why, why nobody just made a product. Yeah. To solve this that thing. <laughs> yeah. And the same thing, and it's just crazy. My mind is blown. Same thing with the wind defender. The inventor of that is my friend Mark mm -hmm. Dooley. And I talked oh, to okay. him. Yeah. I talked to him and picked his brain. And he said, why is there not already a solution for this problem? We've had this problem for ever yep. and nobody made a product. What? And so he said when he went out to sell his product, a lot of people just looked at him and said, yeah, what big deal? This was already solved. He's like, no, I just solved this problem. <laughs> and so people were shocked that there wasn't already a product or a solution out there for the issue. Yep. Huh. And that's always the same. And then people look at it like, huh? This, this cannot do anything, just this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Put it on your instrument and just play a skill and then with and without. And if you really want to know, play with two person. Two players, two flute players, just a skill in in octaves. That's the most amazing skill we can play as flute players in octaves. That's always very nice. And then put a Le Freak on, then you know, then you know what to do. That's, oh. that's really a kind of experience if you do it. Wow. Very cool. So do you have any advice or suggestions for the new inventor, somebody who has an idea, but just doesn't know where to start, what would your one suggestion be? Look at yourself in the mirror and promise yourself that you never give up. That's the only thing you don't have to do because in the first moment, you will always have those people that that are on the internet and they say, oh, it can't be, and they make, make funny things of it and they think they're so pretty smart and just believe in your product mm -hmm. and... Just go on and know that you do it for a good cause. You make flute playing or whatever, what you make easier or better, or if you make a support for a thump, but that you help a lot of people with it because they can have the same problems. So you do a good thing and just believe in it and never stop, never quit. Mm, I love that. And just the fact that, like you mentioned, contributing to the community like it's not yeah. just you're not just solving your problem, but, you know, you're solving hundreds, if not thousands of other people's yeah. same problem. Yeah. You know, my biggest decision I had to make, it was a very strange one because I made a product and my saxophone was the most in tune saxophone, I'm convinced, on the planet. So I could make it for myself and not tell anyone. Yeah. And I could have a lot of advantage for, of it. And I played a lot of concerts in that time and I had really hard times to make the decision. Do I quit playing and start a product or do I play? Hmm. And for my idea, I thought, I'm, yeah, maybe it's going to take me two, three years to tell the world that I have a freak and then I can play again because everyone will hear it immediately. And then I was like, oh, 
it's not so going so fast as I had hoped. Mm. And then we, we made this product and you need to go on the whole world to the whole world at the same moment. So we are in the US, we are in China, we are in Japan, we are in 35 countries. And you have to start over the whole world because the patent is almost worldwide. So it is now year number eight. Mm. And yeah, I'm trying to play a little bit again. I, I bought my new saxophone and I bought a new flute. And so I'm trying to play a little more and I hope to play some concerts again because it took away the thing what, that I love most in life was music. Yeah. And that I love to, to hear that I I make a lot of other people happy. And I don't know if it's too much, but I'm just returned from the Chicago Midwest Clinic in at the end of the year. Yeah. And there was a really cool high school band from Florida and the uh, Stoneman Douglas High School Band, and they all used the Freak at the concert. They have it now for almost a year. Wow. And it was, yeah, I still get goosebumps if I think about it, because there were people crying and people saying, like, I never, ever heard this in my life. And because the whole wind band was so in tune. Wow. This is an experience that's so amazing. So, and then I was so happy and I thought, okay, I don't play myself, but this is it. Wow. So. Yeah. No, just even, I can imagine you sitting in the audience, just looking up at this band and seeing your product and how it's benefited music and just yeah. feeling completely speechless. Like, look at what I accomplished along with my team. And it's, yeah. it's a reality. Yeah, it was really amazing. And I didn't know that they were coming because... I didn't look at the program. I had my boot. And I, I, one of the kids came on the boot and I didn't see them, but I was somewhere else. And my colleague said, I just saw people from the Stone and Douglas High School band. And I was like, no way. <laughs> so I look at the program. I said, wow, okay. So I did, they did a full concert and it was really amazing. Wow. What a neat story. Thank you. So in the last segment of my show, I do a portion called Picks. It can be music-related or not. Are there any picks that you would like to offer the listeners, like a book or a movie? Or it could be food, or it could be... Oh, no, no. no. It's not wind-related at all. I'm not a very good piano player. Yeah. I had to do it at the conservatory. But I just showed to a big friend of mine, a bassoon player, when we drove back up in the car, I turned on a CD in my car and it's a window in time and it's Rachmaninoff playing on the piano and they recorded on piano rolls. And that's one of the most amazing CDs you can ever listen to. So oh. I think all the, the movements in rubato and all the, yeah, all the musicality that you can ever learn is in this CD. Oh, wow. So a window in time, Rachmaninoff. Plays Rachmaninoff. <laughs> I can't wait to really listen also, to it. That's really amazing. Oh, that is great. Thank you for that wonderful pick. Yeah, that's what came up first in my mind. So I thought that's maybe it's a good thing. Perfect. I have a couple picks. One is a book that most people are probably familiar with, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Franklin Covey. Mm -hmm. And um, another book I read recently, many people may not be familiar with this one, is called The Art of Possibility by the Xanders. And it's great. It talks about creativity and being a creator and just the process of music making. And so I think that's very applicable to what we do as musicians, of course. And since you mentioned an album, I just listened to Barbara Streisand's Greatest Hits album, and it was great. Amazing. Yeah. It's so good, Barbara Streisand. Yeah. My favorite yeah. song on that album was uh, People. It starts off with a oh, beautiful yeah. flute solo, actually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, it was the song I did with the choir. I did conducting, and I also had to conduct a choir, and I had to make an arrangement. Yeah. And I had to conduct it. And guess what number it was? People? Yes. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. What a small world. <laughs> I didn't even... That is crazy. Yeah. Huh. 
Wow, very, very cool. Well, that's a great way to wrap this up. <laughs> I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Hans, for your time, energy, and talent. I loved picking your brain and getting to know who you are better and your product. And you should be very proud and pleased with the results of La Freak, as I know you are. But thank you so much for your contribution to the community. Thank you. Yeah, if I know another thing I c that can help, I will make it also. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe something comes up again. But yeah. I'm very happy this can help people also Good. by playing, by playing. Yeah, like you said earlier, you said your mind is always thinking, always going. It's kind of like the Energizer Bunny. Yeah, it's something that you just have and you cannot stop it. So I just have to use it, I think. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. And if people in the U.S. want to see us as a team, maybe it's good to say that we are at uh, the FMEA. And uh, we are at the NEM show and we are at the TMEA. That's our the first three. So wow. if they want to visit us, we are there. Oh, nice. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Great, Hans. Well, you have a great night and hopefully we will meet soon. And if not, talk soon. And I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for calling <laughs> and I hope you have a very nice day. Goodbye. Thank you, Hans. Bye-bye. Today's episode is sponsored by J&K Productions. They produce all of my episodes from adding the intro and outro music to editing the audio and all post-production needs. Contact them for your next podcast project at jkproductions.media. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. For more information, please visit HeidiKBegay.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review in the iTunes store. Let's talk about flute.